Hello and welcome to the Lights on the Screen podcast. I am your host and whiplash hater, Jacob, and joined as always by Damien Chazelle's biggest fan, uh, one of Damien Chazelle's biggest fans, <laughs> Damien, Taylor. Damien Chazelle's biggest fans, one and two. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor, how are you? I'm very good. I just finished my second watch of Babylon a couple hours ago, so I'm ready to I'm ready to get into it. There's we got a lot to talk about today. Yeah, we do. And uh, La La Land's biggest fan. That's me. Hello. I also didn't know you were a Whiplash hater. <laughs> what? Okay. Whiplash is a four out of five star movie. It is a then very- Then why are you calling it a hate? Uh, because, a because, hater? because it's, I'm not on the, oh my God, this is the greatest movie ever. When when it came out, I was the hater for it because everyone was giving it best picture, best movie of the year. And, I, and it was- like it was like where I so am. So you with, like um, it like ten percent less than everyone else. So. Exactly. It's like where I am with um everything everywhere right now. It's right. like I really like this movie, just not at the way everyone, everyone else, else does. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so uh, I get called the whiplash hater. <laughs> Taylor makes jokes about it all the time to me. Like she constantly. Just, <laughs> yeah, she just calls me a, a whiplash hater. But even though I very much like this movie. Cool. Um, <laughs> Uh, this week on the show, we dive deep into Hollywood in the 1920s with Damien Chazelle's epic take on the golden age of Hollywood. But before we get into that, Taylor, what have you been watching? Well, you and I have been watching the same. Like, we have. Or what we've been watching has been the same because we went through and redid Chazelle. We did. Before Babylon. And um, the man just doesn't miss, you know? I really, I don't know. Like, it's kind of astonishing because... Whiplash is a solid movie mm-hmm. in terms of tone and pacing and shot composition and editing. Like the music, the way the m- music is utilized is brilliant. Like the cast is really good. Like it's just a solid movie. Mm. Um, and then you move on to La La Land, which is the movie, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> like it's just, it's the movie. It's. The return of the big, flashy musical that we hadn't really had yeah. on screen in a long time, with original music, which was it's a hu- was a huge deal. Like they just weren't making movies like that on that kind of scale. Um, and I love it. I listen to the soundtrack and the score all the time. Like we are. Uh, we all watched the movie probably way too much, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, and it's just, again, it's so expertly made. The production design is incredible. Score is incredible. The cast is wonderful. And then First Man is the... I, I would love to pick his brain about First Man because it... Now that I've seen Babylon, I can say this even more so. It is the one movie that makes no sense yeah. in, in his filmography. Yeah. Babylon and La La Land and Whiplash all have a very common thread where you can look at them and say, yeah, I can believe that these, the, were, the same that these were the same director. You look at First Man and you go, what is this? <laughs> and I mean that in the best possible way. Yeah. Because First Man, to me, I watch it and I go, this is clearly a film made by someone who knows how to direct a film. Like he knows how to move a camera around. He knows how to frame a shot. He, it's just like a very technically well-made, interesting movie, especially when it comes to the shots in space. Like, they just feel claustrophobic, and it's it's just so well done. But I, if I was shown that movie and someone was like, hey, tell me who made this movie, Chazelle would not be at my top, like, 20 <laughs> answers that I would give you, except maybe if I, like, tried to use the score to help me figure it out, mm. then maybe. But even then, it's just such a departure from what they normally do. Um, And I think it's easily Gosling at his very best. Like, I don't think we've ever seen anything like that from him before. Um, And then, you know, we get to Babylon, which we'll talk about later. But going back through those first three movies really solidified for me. Like, all right, if I even think Babylon is, like, great... Not brilliant, but even if if I just think Babylon is great, then he's going to be top five director all time for me, easily. Like, he he is so stylistically, like, on my level. Like, I just love what he does. 
I think him and Horowitz have kind of the best partnership ever, basically. Mm -hmm. Like, his, his scores just are magical, and they just match so well with everything that Chazelle is trying to do. Um, so I'm really, really excited, honestly, to just see their partnership moving forward because, man, he really could be one of, like, the greats by mm -hmm. the end of his career if yeah. he just keeps knocking them out. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to follow on from you. Like, I... I Redoing this rewatch, I had seen First Man once in theaters when it came out. I'd seen Whiplash, I think, twice. Um, I had I didn't really watch rewatch Whiplash a lot. La La Land, I had seen a lot. I have rewatched La La Land a lot of times. Um, redoing this rewatch, it solidified to me again. Yeah, Whiplash is the one that I that I, it, it, he he progressively got better throughout his filmmaking. Um, I was shocked at how much I loved First Man because the first time I saw it, I thought I think I went into First Man wanting the typical biopic that they sold. They sold this fairly typical Neil Armstrong biopic, and it was it's not that. It's a meditation on grief, on toxic masculinity, on the on dealing with loss and against the backdrop of the biggest male event of the last century. The way that you described it to me when we were watching the movie is my favorite thing I've ever heard. Mm. You're like, man would rather leave the planet yeah. completely than go see a therapist <laughs> to deal with his grief. He literally is going to leave the atmosphere because he doesn't want to deal with his emotional problems. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah and I like for those, you know, it's about a man who – who lost his child and is dealing with the grief of losing a child. And he just happens to be one of the most famous American heroes of all time. Like I, I you're right. This is Gosling at his absolute best. I think it's my favorite Ryan Gosling performance. I, I love this performance so much. It, it's subtle. It's subdued. The, he, everything is behind the eyes. You can see all the pain suffering he's going through. I, I love that movie. It's, La La Land is, is it's funny. La La Land holds the special place in my heart. I think First Man's a better film in terms of like craftsmanship. But La La Land just has that like hold over you of just no this this just means more whereas in yeah, so I think his craft has gotten better slowly over the three films and then yeah, when we redid Babylon. But yeah, that that I you're right. Like, as someone who has never really thought of Chazelle as a top five director for me, it's four films in. Yeah, he is. With four films, he's up there for me personally. I, I think he's... We still need to watch his actual debut. We I haven't, know. It we is haven't gotten around it to it It is impossible yet, to find in Australia, so I, I need to try and find it. But I... Again, he's a fantastic director. I'm so glad we did this re these rewatches. And his films for me especially, have a deeper appreciation the second and third time you rewatch them. Like, you can appreciate a lot more about them um, on rewatches than the first time. Well, I just think that has a lot to do with, like, the craftsmanship of it. Like, he puts so much... Him and his crew that he employs, they put so much detail and so much just attention into what they're making that... I mean, I know that, you know, Babylon is chaotic, but even outside of that, it follows that trend with all of the other movies where you watch him and you just notice these little things that he does, which I think is awesome. Like, I love movies that you don't necessarily have to watch it more than once to appreciate it, but if you do, you're going to find all of these things. Yeah. Lana, what have you watched this week? Not Damien Chazelle movies. <laughs> so I, I did rewatch La La Land, but that's that happens every week, so it's fine. Um, have you stopped logging it or are you still logging it? I'm still logging it. But <laughs> when I say watch, I mean I put it on before bed and I watched right. 20 minutes and then I fell asleep. That's, so okay. um, I think in two more nights I'll have finished the next 40 minutes. So yeah. I'll log it then. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't count Archer anymore. Like I, I've lost times of how many times I've watched uh, the Archer TV series Fair just because that's how I fall asleep movie or show. Fair enough. But yeah, I did watch um, only like two movies outside of what we've had to watch for like the podcast and stuff. So I watched Donnie Darko for the first time because I got this on 4K and it was the director's cut as well. So I'm actually 
want to go back and watch the theatrical cut as well now because I'm does wondering it have the, like does what the 4K diff- have both? Yeah. Okay. It's both of them on 4K, which is good. Um, so I'm wondering like how different they are. Um, but I loved this movie. I kind of knew I would, but I also was worried because everyone was kind of like saying how mind fucky it is and how you are like no, you can't really understand it. I think the director's cut might help with that because I got it very easily. I think for its time, it was very yeah. mind effy. Um, when you watch his other two movies, going back to this one, it's like, oh, this is like Nothing. basic. <laughs> his other two okay. movies are very oh the box. The box is just a bad movie, but um, his Southern f- Tales is that, and it's not good. Right. <laughs> Fair. But, yeah, and it's, this also kind of cemented – I realized I haven't really watched many Jake Gyllenhaal movies outside of, like, Spider-Man. <laughs> so I think that <laughs> – Okay. <laughs> I just like I just realized like I haven't really seen him do much besides like be in Taylor Swift discourse. <laughs> so I actually like this he's really a great actor actor. He I is. had a friend who like drilled into me that he was like a um an S tier actor and I was like, Yeah, all right, but this is like out of this world performance and he was so young, so it was really awesome. Um really loved it and I'm really keen to revisit it. And then I also just rewatched Tar, which we've already talked about, but this is my third time watching it, which you wouldn't think that, that this would be a movie someone needs to watch three times, but fell asleep the first time, fell, took me three days to watch the, the second time. So this time it was a 6.30 session in a cinema. It was bound to, it was, I was bound to not fall asleep and it was great. I bumped it up from three to four stars and I get the hype. Because before it was just like the hype for her performance, but now I'm like, no, nope, this this is a great movie, and Todd Field's direction and the screenplay and the, even down to the editing, it's very, very, very good. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what I watched this week. All right, uh, let's move on. Obviously Tuesday. So when you guys are listening to this, it'll be uh, Saturday in just uh, three days. The Oscar nominations will drop. We are going to do a live reaction. It will be a bonus episode for you guys. It will be up on the podcast or on the feed on Wednesday morning. Um, so, guys, let's just go through real quick. We're going to do we'll, – we'll do the eight majors. So, director, picture, the six actors, and the two writing awards. And we'll go through what are our nominations. What do Locked we think – uh, what are our predictions for nominations – uh, I'll start, Taylor, your best picture. I'm so not confident in any of these, <laughs> by the way, but we're going to lock them in anyway. Um, all right. I have The Fablemans, Top Gun Maverick, Everything Everywhere, The Banshees, Evina Sharon, Tar, Elvis, Avatar, The Way of Water, All Quiet on the Western Front, Glass Onion, and Babylon. Okay. Uh, I've got Top Gun Maverick, All Quiet on the Western Front, Avatar The Way of Water, Babylon, The Banshees of Inner Sharon, Elvis, Everything Everywhere All at Once, The Fablemans, Glass, Onion, and Tar. Okay. I have Everything Everywhere, The Fablemans, The Banshees of Inner Sharon, Top Gun Maverick, Elvis, Tar, Avatar The Way of Water, Babylon, Women Talking, and All Quiet on the Western Front. Ooh, all right. Taylor, best director. This is a mess. Yeah. <laughs> this, I, again, no, co- like, okay. Steven Spielberg, <laughs> Daniels, Martin McDonough, Todd Field, and Edward Berger. Ooh. But I don't, I'm not confident in it. We have the same five. <laughs> I'm really same. not. I'm, I have, yeah, we all have the same we're five. Not, yeah. I'm not confident in it, though. Different, yeah. Like, one of those... I feel like I'm wrong about the ch- the first like Daniels Spielberg Field and McDonough. I'm pretty certain, but I feel like that fifth spot. I'm I'm starting to feel like Field might. I not. know, me too. That's, really? the, one I'm, the, that's one the one I'm, I'm starting to about. really Field's the one I'm starting to get a right. bit iffy because okay. again, I'm I'm very confident a foreign direct film is getting it. Yeah. I am very and confident it's be on that. All quiet. Yeah, I'm that's and that's where I'm at. That's why I dropped yeah. I dropped RRR. I wanted to put that in, but I think it's gonna be but all if quiet. If it's not Todd Field, then who? That's what I don't know. It's I think it could like it's either going to be Cameron or Sarah Polly. True. To get a woman in there. Uh, to, yeah, and I think that could happen. Right. Um but again, I also don't know. I we I think we're gonna start knowing when we get through a lot of the nominations at the start and 
if women talking starts picking some up, I'm going to go, okay, it's going to get to yeah. a direct spot. If, cause if it starts missing, then we're going to be like, all right, uh, that, that final spot's going to be real interesting. Fair. I also wouldn't put it put past the Academy to be like, no, we're just going to give it to Giselle because we've nominated him before. That too. And they just, you know what I mean? Like just something, cra- like, I don't know. Yeah. I just have this weird feeling. One of these categories, the Academy is going to do what the Academy does. And we're going to be like, what the hell yeah. is that? I just don't know where it's going to yeah. come from. <laughs> well, the other crazy thing is, and and like, I should have said this before we started, but I forgot. Um, this is the most voting they've ever had. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 the most the Academy has ever had. So people are clearly passionate about this year. And they're like, I am voting no matter what. Or everything what. everywhere. All well, well, either that <laughs> or... But, like, for their movie, they are they are passionate and there is that yep. absolute belief that I am going to vote for this. It could be everything everywhere that's that's doing it. And I would love if it is. Like, I think that would be a really great and fun thing. It could be Top Gun. It could be Fablemans. It could be Banshees. Like, I, th- there's – I think we're all in agreement that there's four movies mm. that it could be. One of those, but, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Let's move on to Best Actress. Uh, Elena, I'm going to start with you for this one. Michelle Yeoh, Kate Blanchett, Daniel Deadweiler, uh, Michelle Williams, and Viola Davis. I have Michelle Yeoh, Kate Blanchett, Michelle Williams, Viola Davis, and Margot Robbie. I have Michelle Williams, Kate Blanchett, Michelle, um, sorry, Mich- uh, Michelle Yeoh, Kate Blanchett, Michelle Williams, Viola Davis, and Anna Diarmas. Wow, we all have a different like that fifth, fifth spot. That fifth spot could literally. Anna, Anna was in there today, and I swapped. I actually swapped her out for Viola. Okay, I had Daniel in there. Danielle in there for sure. I, I'm not confident on Danielle. I, Neither, because it's like she's like the only thing from that movie. But it could be a year. Oh, uh, the Billy Holiday movie. Yeah, like just her. Yeah. yeah. So that fifth spot, man. No, it's that fifth spot's going to be nuts. All right, uh, best actor. I'm going to let you start because I'll give you your moment. <laughs> Look, there. Are, I'm only confident about three of these. Mm. The, yeah. the three that I'm confident about are Austin Butler, Colin Farrell, and Brendan Fraser. That's it. Yeah, yeah same. My other two spots are going to Bill Nye mm-hmm. and to Tom Cruise. Okay. But literally, literally, I would not be shocked if those two spots go to anyone else. Like, yeah. I'm not even joking. Like, those two spots, freaking Paul could show up in that spot. Uh, Diego could show up in that spot. Like, nothing would surprise me at this point. Like, because as much as Nye has been getting awards attention in other places, I don't know. Like, no one's talking about it. No one's talking about it. Like, I don't actually know how the Academy feels about Tom right now. Mm. So, yeah. like, I I don't know. I have three of my nominations are what I consider a lock. The other two, I just kind of threw something in there. That's fair. Uh, I've got Austin for Elvis, Colin Farrell for the Banshees, Brendan Fraser for The Whale, Tom Cruise for Top Gun, and I've got Paul for After Sun. Yeah, I've got Colin, Austin, Brendan, and then Bill Nye and Paul Meskel. Mm. I'm... I'm riding on the Paul Mescal train. Let's make I, it happen. Yeah. I, I'm still uh, – I look, I'm putting a lot of Top Gun in manifesting destiny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to we're, we're all trying to manifest. <laughs> we're all manifesting yeah. things. I'm not allowed to manifest on this podcast. All right. Uh, supporting actress. I'll start with this one. Uh, I've got Jamie Lee Curtis, Car- uh, Carrie Condon, uh, Stephanie Zhu, Angela Bassett, and Dolly D. Leon. I've got Angela Bassett, Jamie Lee Curtis, Carrie Condon, uh, Stephanie Shu, and Hong Chow. Mine's the same as yours, Jacob. It's just Ooh. in a different order. Okay. So mm. that's yeah. another one where it's like, I mean, I hope, I feel like Stephanie Shu and Hong Chow are the ones that are interchangeable, like mm. the last spots on Best Actor. I mean, yeah, Best Actor. So I'm also like Taylor, like, I. Those two spots could go to anyone. Yeah, I have. I'm. I'm fairly confident that everything everywhere is going to get two, and I hope so. I think Carrie's going to get nominated. I'm. I'm reluctantly agreeing <laughs> that Angela is getting nominated. Yes, I'm at that point that Angela is going to She's- get nominated, and 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 I've said this in a tweet. This has absolutely nothing to do with Angela. As an actress, I'm very glad she's going to get another an Oscar nomination. If she wins, I'm going to be happy for her that she's finally an Academy Award winner. I just hate that it's for this movie. 
Well, that, that, that's how I feel a lot of the time with the Academy. Like, mm. I'm glad Leonardo DiCaprio finally got his Oscar, but the role he won it for made me furious. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, this is not what he deserves an Oscar yeah. for. Like, that happens all the time where yeah. I'm like, hey, I'm glad this really talented actor or actress is now an Academy Award winner, but this was not the time to do it. That's yeah. how I'm going to feel. Yeah, and that's that's where I'm at, so is what it is. All right, supporting actor, Taylor. Okay. I've got Kihei Kwan for Everything Everywhere, Paul Dano, Barry Keegan, Brendan Gleeson, and then my fifth spot, again, as as is <laughs> the trend, could go to anyone, but I'm walking in Brad Pitt. Ooh. I got these, the same, exact same five. I've got um, that, but Judd Hirsch. I yeah. substituted him in today. Even though I don't agree that he should be there. No, I <laughs> my I I had Judd Hirsch for the longest time, and then my justification for why I've put Brad Pitt in is one, because I finally saw it and I love that performance. Um but two, I don't know if the Academy is going to give two films two nominations two from True. The, in the same category. True. It will I, I just we've never seen it before. I just think it would I, – I can't see the Academy doing it. So They might just do it because he, Kihei Kwan is winning anyway. So maybe, like, fuck yeah. Fuck the rest of the category. <laughs> maybe. Um, all right, let's move on to adapted screenplays. This is where it starts getting a little bit more chaotic because mm. I've definitely gone a little chaotic. Uh, I'll go first. Women Talking, The Whale, Glass Onion, She Said, and All Quiet on the Western Front. Oh, okay. Tell um, yeah, I'm definitely going chaotic <laughs> with mine. Uh, so I have women talking, glass onion, all quiet, living, and Top Gun. I have glass onion, women talking, the whale, Top Gun, and all quiet. Top Gun? Yep. Yep. Okay. Again, I'm <laughs> manifesting destiny here because if it gets nominated for that and actor. There's a. I'm gonna. Oh, I'm gonna be this unbearable. Is gonna be an interesting live I'm reaction. gonna be unbearable. <laughs> and I'm gonna literally leave. <laughs> if it gets nominated for a screenplay nomination, I'm just gonna be like, bye guys. You finished the podcast. I'm like yourselves. this has been fun, but uh, nope. <laughs> All right, and our final one: original screenplay. Uh, Taylor. I don't want to go first. Okay. I've got, <laughs> I'll go first. Uh, I've got Everything Everywhere All at Once, The Banshees of Inner Sharon, The Fablemans, Triangle of Sadness, and After Sun. I have Banshees, Everything Everywhere, Tar, The Fablemans, and After Sun. Uh, I don't like this. <laughs> I, have, I have Everything Everywhere, Banshees, Fablemans, Tar, and Triangle, but I don't think that's, like, I think one of them is going to miss out. Mm. for either After Sun or Babylon to sneak mm. in. Like, mm. I just don't – that's what I have, but I don't know. Like, I'm sticking with it, but I don't think it's right. Like, it's that's just fair. one of those – I don't – I don't know, man. I feel like the Academy's going to pull some crap this year. <laughs> it's got, I'm like, fascinated I'm by where it. we're going to go. I'm ready. All right, so that's our uh, – they, they are our predictions for the major categories in this coming – we will announce the winner when it happens. <laughs> Right. We are going to tally it up and see who gets the most. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. We definitely to. will. Yeah. yeah. I um actually okay. So something that I do want to bring up um that we will also be finding out if I how close I came is in September every year. Me being an idiot, I true. like to embarrass myself publicly. And also true. I put out what before the awards season before the movies have screened, majority of them at least, I will put out a prediction on what I think are going to be the nominations. So this is just Did you actually release this? Yeah, I put this on Twitter. All right. This is all this <laughs> I is on didn't Twitter. Have Twitter back then. No, I know. No one no one no one liked it. No one even looked at it. So <laughs> that's all right. That's fine. But I, I, I at least make it public and embarrass myself. So I'm gonna put it on here just so that you guys know. It's great seeing what I actually put and how wrong I was. Let's see your best picture. Um, <laughs> this is this list is hilarious. It is. Oh my god, I'm excited. Okay, so my best picture predictions. Here are the ten films that I had: Fablemans, Fair, Babylon. Yes. I'm gonna go to the ones that I actually know are gonna be correct, or that are somewhat in the conversation. Women talking, uh-huh. Top Gun, uh-huh. Everything Everywhere All at Once. So there are five that I could That's maybe get safe. right. I also had The Sun. I'm very, that's fair. I'm at very that, high time, on the sun. At that time, it's fair. Yeah, I was very high on the sun yeah. at that point. She said, "At that time, fair." 
Empire of Light. At that time, fair. <laughs> Bardo. Slay. I and Triangle it. of Sadness. That's fair. Yes. I'd say those are fair things in September last year. Yeah, when we <laughs> when like the the sun is the embarrassing one on yeah. here because I've got it in I think nearly every category and then the movie came out and it just straight up Everyone no. Hate it. It's so funny how much Sean Fennessy from the Big Picture hates that. You mm, should listen to that. Yeah. It's hilarious. I yeah, like I was so high on the father and that's that's what made me like really like back the sun. I was like, this is it. This is what's going to be the thing. Anyway, so director, I had Damien Chazelle, Steven Spielberg, Sarah Polly, Florian Seller, and uh, Ruben Osland. That's a slow So I, 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 I'm not too, that one, I'm not too embarrassed. By. I would love if that was the line. Yeah. To be uh, actress, I had Margot Robbie, Olivia Coleman, Viola Davis, Michelle Yeoh, and Kate Blanchett. Wait, what was the middle one you said? Uh, Viola Davis no. and Olivia Coleman. Olivia Coleman. Yeah. Yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, but that one, not too bad. Um, best actor, I had Hugh Jackman, Brendan Fraser, Austin Butler, Colin Farrell, and uh, Daniel Gamez, Kako for Barber. Bar- Bardo. Barber. <laughs> Bar- <laughs> that, 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 a lot of words. Bardo. Yep, a lot of words. Very, I, would, very I said this on my Instagram. I would love if he was to get nominated. Mm. That would be like a dream fucking nomination for me, but um, no. This is the one that I'm not going to get a single one of these correct, I don't think, in, in supporting actress. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but to be fair, this was because one of them, she was the front runner in in act, in act supporting actress, Michelle Williams. Right. Um, so I had her and Michelle in supporting actress. Vanessa Kirby for The Sun. Jesse Buckley for Women Talking. Jean Smart for Babylon, which is, I think, the one I'm most heartbroken about because she's mm, incredible. Yeah. And Sadie Sink in The Whale. Wow. Um, I think I had that. Back then as well. Yeah. Like, that was kind of, yeah. And last one, I had Paul Dano for, in Sporting Actor, I had Paul Dano for Fableman's, uh, Ki Kwan for Everything Everywhere, Michael Ward for Empire of Light, Woody Harrelson for Triangle of Sadness, and my most embarrassing one is Chris Pine for Don't Worry Darling. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that before that movie came out, everyone was like, like I, I probably had it in my best picture list. I think I did as well. Yeah, <laughs> and then it was I think, like, yeah. Ooh, this is I not think, an Academy movie at I all. I think it was in mine originally, but then we had heard. I think that at that point, the the first reviews had dropped, and I was like, "Oh, I'm taking that mm. out." <laughs> um, but yeah, so That's yeah, just a public embarrassment. Um, I like doing it every September because. It just goes to show you how much people changes. like it changes yeah. over the course. The what were the things pre pre awards, pre festivals, like that were like, oh, this is the thing, and then we get to the end. I mean, this this year was a little weird because like three of the films that are going to get nominated were released pre festivals, so like it's it's that you know we're big and we knew from pre festivals, so it's it's going to be really really interesting. Um, Guys, let's move on to the movie of, that we're going to be talking about, obviously, and uh, that the rest of this episode is going to focus on because we really need to dive into this one, and that is, of course, Babylon, a tale of outsized ambition and outrageous excess. Babylon, the new film from Academy Award-winning director Damien Chazelle, traces the rise and fall of multiple characters during an era of unbridled decadence and depravity in early Hollywood. What about you? Sorry? If you could go anywhere in the whole world, where would you go? I always want to be part of something bigger. I love that answer. Something that lasts, that means something. Something yes. more important than life. Yes. It's written in the stars. I am a star. I had money, I would only spend it on things that were fun, you know? Not boring things like taxes. I'm just wanting for everyone to party forever. All right. What did we think of Babylon? I'm going to let you start <laughs> because you have been looking forward to this. I think, I, I, to be fair, both, both of you two have been looking forward to this movie, I think, all year. Mm-hmm. I have very much been looking forward to this as well, but I am definitely at this table third on the Damien Chazelle hype train. Mm-hmm. So... <laughs> um. Where, what did you think? I loved it. I was so scared walking into that theater. Like, I 
lowered my expectations for this so much because I was terrified that it would be a bit too much because movies like this usually don't work for me. Um, And all the reviews online were literally like either people despise it or people love it. It's the best thing they've ever seen. There is like no in between. Like Mm -hmm. I can't imagine someone giving this like three stars. (laughs) Yeah, You know what I mean? So I feel like. I was really worried that I wouldn't like it. And so I like made myself think I wouldn't like it so that if I went in and loved it, it was like hype. And I just adored it. And I, ugh, I was just, <laughs> I was like five wines in starting the film and that's <laughs> the best way to watch it. Cause it's just excess and It's maximal and it's throwing so much at you in those first like 40 minutes before the title card. By the way, side note, if a movie has the title card like 30 or 40 minutes into the movie, that's how you know it's Kino. It's like (laughs) so epic when it does that. (laughs) And yeah, it just like doesn't stop. And I was actually talking to a friend at work today and he was like, like he was worried it wouldn't like it would just like keep getting higher and higher and it did like have those mellow moments which like balanced Mm. everything really well but that first sequence is just epic with the party and the dancing and the score everything and we'll get more into the end later on but just first thoughts that's i i knew i was gonna love it straight away what were your because you and i have seen it twice Mm-hmm. What were your th- first initial thoughts and then your second screening? So my first initial thoughts were like, wow, I really need some time to process this mm. because it is a lot of movie. It's a long movie and it doesn't really slow down mm. and give you a second to kind of catch up with anything that's going on for the most part. Um, so... I think for me, after seeing it the first time, the thing that really stood out to me were the performances. Um, Seeing Margot Robbie and Diego Calvo specifically just kind of fearlessly and relentlessly take on roles that are so big and demand so much. Like, they're not subdued performances whatsoever. Like, you have... They they had to have been exhausted Mm. after every single day on set with just how much it was demanding of them to do. Um, And I thought they both carried it really, really well. Like you mentioned earlier, I think Brad Pitt does a great job in the role. Um, So it's a little weird. People haven't really been talking about it. Um, But yeah, I think for me, after the first watch, it was mostly just trying to let it all sink in, like what I had seen. Um, And then the second watch, the pacing worked a lot better for me. It didn't feel anywhere near as long because Mm. my brain wasn't trying to process so much information at one time i kind of was ready for it um and again the performances really stand out the score really stands out um it's just something that doesn't pull any of its punches like it's messy and chaotic and it's just fully going at 100 miles per hour the entire time and it's one of those movies that is really divisive and is made like it's made to be that way in my opinion this movie is not made to you know be the shining shimmering kind of sanitized version of of hollywood that we see even when hollywood is being portrayed as messy like there's usually a little bit of shine to it whereas this movie is very much not concerned with doing that Mm -hmm. um and i like that i think i think it's good to have a movie like this where it takes really big swings the whole time and it kind of doesn't care whether you are going to go along for the ride or not. Like, you have to make that decision. And if you choose to go along and and roll with the swings, then you're going to have a great time and it's going to take you on this crazy adventure and it's going to pay off by the end of it. But you have to be willing to go with it and just kind of shed all of your expectations of what a movie like this typically kind of might look like. Yeah, I the first time I watched it, <clears throat> I walked out kind of I don't know if disappointed is the right word, but I struggled with this a lot. And 
the first time I watched it, I, I really struggled with it because one, and we'll get to, we can get to it in spoilers, but Singing in the Rain is one of my all-time favorite movies. I love, I love Singing in the Rain a lot, and this movie is a lot of Singing in the Rain, and we'll get to it more in spoilers. Um, the other thing is I think a lot of it just felt messy and self-indulgent and just a little bit like, like you were saying, it's a lot to process and you really need to process this movie. And it just, a lot of it felt, I, I, and like, I understood why it was doing what it was doing, but I also was very much like, I didn't like how it was doing it. I felt it was, I felt the editing was all over the place. I, I was very surprised by a lot of it. And I think that first half an hour really kind of put me off a bit. The second time I watched it, this is one of the best movies of the year. And I just fell in love with it the second time even more. And I think what you were saying of giving yourself into this movie and, and just falling for it and just allowing it to tell the story that it's telling to really like – connect with these characters and that was something I was able to do a lot more on the second time was just really connect and and not so much feel the pacing issues that I had in the first time and kind of not be so off put by the first 20 minutes in and when I say off put I think it was just shock, shocking in that way of I knew it was going to come out of, I, I knew this movie was going to be very filled with filth and decadence and debauchery, but it was just so surprising just how much out of the gate it was. Um, and I think, and like, and I'm not someone who's, you know, gets st- st- like put off by any of that. It was just more just surprising. Like, Oh, okay. That's, that's where we're going with this. Like going back, what did you mean by self-indulgence? Like as in Damien, like showing off what he can do as a filmmaker or like the yeah, story. Yeah, I think it was just a little bit. Yeah, I thought I thought it was very much I thought it would, yeah, it was self-indulgent in that type of Chazelle like just showing here's what I can do, here's what I can do, here's what I can do. Mm. And I just didn't it didn't really work for me that much. The second time though and, and I don't believe that at all the second time. I was like no, this gotcha. that's this is this is there for a reason. This is I, I. It's not his best directing work, but it's one of. Like I, I think this is incredibly well directed. Okay. Um, Self indulgence is just a trigger word for me. That's so. fair. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, okay. I, I, on a tangent, the most self indulgent I've seen is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. This and I felt like yeah. it was that for a little bit. It it's not that. It um fair. so uh, this. The the best phrase I've heard about this movie is it's a love letter to cinema and a hate letter to Hollywood. Yeah. That, like, yeah. it loves cinema, it loves film, and it loves what film represents and what and the feelings and emotions you get from it. It absolutely hates how they're made. And yeah, it definitely. hates Hollywood and, it, and it's just... It's, it's told really well and that's, like, definitely the... That's, like, the statement to sum it up. Yeah. In, like, one sentence. It's, yeah. Um, but... If we want, we can start getting into spoilers because I think there's a lot we want to talk about this one. But does anyone have any like? Do we want to give ratings before we go into spoilers? Yeah. Like, all right, so Taylor, what, what did you? So on a first watch for me, it was a four, and then it bumped up to a four and a half on my second watch. Um, there's definitely room, I think, for it to bump up again, but mm-hmm. we'll see what happens. Um, it's it was same for me. I was. I was a three and a half or four the first time I watched it. And I kind of went four by the, when I left the cinema, it was a three and a half. The time I got home, it was a four. <laughs> then I saw it again on Wednesday and it was a four and a half. <laughs> um, I don't think I, I, I don't know if it's going to get to a five. Um, I do have problems with this one. I, I think it's 20 minutes too long personally. Um, we'll yeah. <laughs> um, but like I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with a four and a half of this one. So, yeah, it, this is one of the best movies of the year. Yeah. Last um, year. Last year, sorry. Last year. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know how I am with five stars, so I give it five stars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to spoilers. This is your spoiler alert for Babylon. Um, 
let's start with let's just start talking about the performances um because one of the most surprising things for me personally coming out of this movie was the story of oh this was Emma Stone's role originally and i get that she was margot Ro- she was, like was originally cast? she was cast as margot mm. robert and covid stopped that mm. like she had to drop out because of covid wow I could not see no. Emma Stone in this role. Absolutely to be not. fair, it was rewritten. It was rewritten for Margot, yes. But still, like, if it's, like, how rewritten? Because, mm. it, because it's still the, like, kind of messy, like, I don't know, and the character's very, like, has that sexual appeal and maybe that was what was added. But, oh, gosh, that's weird. Mm. <laughs> it would have been fascinating. I would have loved to have seen her tr- try and take that on. Like, it would have mm. been re- it would have been different. Mm. I would have never seen it. It would have been that, oh, we've never seen Emma Stone like this mm-hmm. ever. Um, yeah. I would have been I, I very think, interested. I do think it's, yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. I don't think we've ever seen Emma try something along that kind of vein. Like, it would have been fascinating to watch her go from La La Land to this kind of role. Yeah. Uh, and just, like, see what that looks like. For me, you kind of look at it and go, well, Margo's the obvious choice because this is Wolf of Wall Street cranked up to, like, 200. Yeah. Essentially. Like, we've kind of seen her able to do that role in a smaller capacity. And this is her taking it on as a lead performance. Mm. And I think that um, it's just, it it's, it's the kind of role we've seen her do before, but this one gave her the space to just be able to explore it and push the boundaries and really just take it all the way as far as it could go. Whereas Wolf of Wall Street was like, she's supporting cast. Like it's, she's not really there mm. to do that. Whereas this movie relies on her ability yeah. to be able to do that. She's um, also on Wolf of Wall Street, like playing someone. So yeah, she's yeah. trying to be that mm. thing. Whereas this was like her making her own character. Yeah. Not making her own character, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And Wolf of Wall Street, she's also, she's more the straight person to DiCaprio. Like she's more the Diego character. Yeah. To an extent. To an extent. Yeah. Like, yeah, like I just mean like if we're looking at Emma and we're looking at Margot no, yeah, and you're looking at roles that yeah. show you maybe they can do this. Absolutely. That's what I look at and go, yeah, all right. Yeah, no, that's absolutely fair. I yeah, I, I think Margot's incredible in this. Like sensationally good in this. It is um, sad she's probably not gonna get nominated. And and the thing I think is gonna get overlooked is yeah, we're sitting here talking about like how crazy she can take it and just like oh but that scene where she just has to turn on and off the what, crying oh. and just like <laughs> it's like, oh my god, we're so impressed with like the director and everything, and it's like, yeah, she's actually gonna that's, act that. Yeah, like, like she's that's actually real. doing like yeah. that's a real thing yeah. she has to do. Yeah, that that scene's incredible. There are just moments like that where I look at it and go, damn, that's really gonna be overlooked, but she's phenomenal. Mm. There was an interview where she like actually Actually did that didn't she like there was yeah, yeah. So. and she just started crying in the interview and then she's like yeah cool and i'll do it again <laughs> like she's epic yeah and then um the i'm trying to think like what other like big scene she the okay the scene i think we all can agree i think it's the best scene in the movie or the at least the funniest scene in the movie Hello, and, college. Uh, yeah <laughs> the, the the first time they do that they, they they do sound and it is just hilarious even even for me i thought it was absolutely hilarious and incredible uh we can get we'll get to that when we actually start talking about a bit more about the plot i think um this definitely i want to talk about diego calva and how impressive i think he is Mm. just because he learned english for this role Mm. much like anna de armas did when she did her first, like, whatever her first big w- role was. I think was. War, was War Dogs was the one that she had that I she did. I think didn't, it was. Yeah. I think it was. Um, but it was what I can't. I'm sorry, guys. I can't remember off the top of my head. But so he had to learn English for this role, mm. um, which is just astonishing to me. Mm-hmm. Like when actors are yeah. able to do that. Um, and I heard because I was watching an interview and he was kind of talking about that, um, how he spent like eight months preparing and trying to learn English and and really getting helped with some of the parts of the script where it goes from like English to Spanish and and things like that. And Margo just talking about how impressive it was for him to even just try to ad lib on set when he's trying to like improv in a different language and all, all this stuff. But I think he first of all, he's just a great actor. 
Mm-hmm. I just think there's so many sequences in this film that just show that he has a lot of range and hopefully this is a career launcher for him, even yeah. though it wasn't necessarily a box office success. Hopefully it's enough of it's an industry. Success. It's an industry yeah. thing for him, right? It's a resume thing, hmm. but he, he had to hold his own, not only against Margot Robbie, who might be at her best we've ever seen her hmm. and is stealing every scene that she's in. He has to be on the other side of that yeah. and not disappear completely. But then he has to do it with Brad Pitt. Yep. And he also has to do it with Tobey Maguire. Yeah. Like he gets those all, are he three, gets the three of them. Those yeah. are three. Every, anyone who knows me knows my thoughts on Tobey Maguire. But <laughs> from an acting perspective, having to be, you know, do scenes opposite those three absolute industry giants. Mm-hmm. Insane. In your first role doing English, like that's just. Yeah. It's kind of insane to me. Yeah. To be honest. That's like fair. like he he never feels out of depth. Like when he's when he's hanging out with Brad Pitt, you're like, yeah. It just right. makes sense. Like yeah. it, it just never feels like he's out of place. It never feels like he's trying to learn the craft. Like it just feels like he's been doing this. It goes under the radar, but that is like an incredible feat. It's it is. Epic. It's it's and and I I'm devastated that I'm the thing I think I'm most devastated by this is that there was a real chance that they could have had the four acting nominations. They yeah. could have got one in every category, especially this year. Mm-hmm. And because it tanked, it's not going to. Because I think he absolutely could have been nominated in that I fifth did, spot. I did too. Like if, like you know, as someone who is backing Tom Cruise and really wants him nominated, <laughs> no, I'll take I'll take Diego over Tom Cruise. Like I I, I would I, I would too. I, I just yeah. the reason I didn't put him there is because I think somehow we live in a world where Tom Cruise is more likely. <laughs> not not me. because <laughs> like, like and and I talked a bit about this kind of off when we weren't recording mm. yet. I just completely think that the marketing dropped the ball mm. on this film. I get that it's not an easy film to market. But what, it, like, they also did it a bit too late. Like, even because I do the, like, social media marketing at work and, like, all the featurettes of showing, like, all the, mm. like, here's how we did the production sign and here's how we did the score and stuff. It came in, like, a week ago. Where yeah. it should have come out, like, We should have been talking, ago. yeah. And... Well, not only that, they did really shitty marketing here, which for a Margot Robbie movie should be a crime. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, because people here will go out to see her if you actually tell them that she's in a movie. Mm-hmm. But also, we didn't even get a trailer here. We just got pictures flashing on the screen. Oh, my God. That like, was... it's, like, they didn't give us a trailer yeah. with footage. It's just the posters <laughs> flashing on a screen with some of the score. I don't... I'm assuming the U.S. got actual trailers, mm. but I don't... We act- did ages ago. I remember seeing a trailer sometimes, but then... Like recently in the last month, it's just been literally the pictures. And I'm like, what? (laughs) Like, I just really, it upsets me that this movie was just marketed like crap, especially because of the cast you have involved. Mm. The director you have involved has never made something not good. Mm. You know, like, I just don't like you have the whole recipe for success is here. And they were just like, no, 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 I get you. I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm devastated by how this movie has performed because I really, really loved this movie. And yeah. it's just, it is absolutely sensational. Um, we've kind of danced around him. Brad Pitt's incredible in this. Yes. Like, for given... He knows what he's doing. He does. <laughs> and, and like, yeah, for, with, you know, it, it's tough with all the allegations out there right now around Brad Pitt. It is tough come Oscar season. I completely understand all of that, but... He is incredible. There's, there's in a movie. reason he's one of the biggest movie stars in the world. Yeah. Like, you just watch him in this movie and you're like, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yep. I, I'm i floored by what he is able to do. There are there are three scenes in this movie where I'm like, that's your Oscar clip. That's like yeah, the, yeah. The, the scene he had, the, 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 the three scenes when he finds out that George has been shot. And he's and, uh, and he, yelling and he go, at Catherine uh, Waterston. Yeah. And he's yelling yeah. at, yeah, Catherine Waterston about high art and low art and I, yeah. that I, I love that scene so much and um and then the the other one where he's talking to it's the three it's the three scenes that he's talking about mortality essentially and then yeah. when he's talking to gene smart about see i don't think that's his i think that's hers that that is hers but i think him 
at the start of that, I think is they bounce off each other so well. They do. They fit the chemistry. I don't know if you call it chemistry, but like it is like just on on screen chemistry for sure. Yeah, Yeah. and then his final one at the end with Lady Faye, I think. I think that scene's heartbreaking because you know exactly what he's about to do. Mm-hmm. Like you, you can see it. You, you're just like, he's he's done. And you know when he gives the bellhop the money, you're like, oh, I know where this is going. Like you just knew exactly where. Um, the but going to, uh, I actually want to start talking about Chazelle's directing because I think there the first time I saw it, and I think why. It, didn't really work for me that well was the jump cuts was how quickly it cut not the jump the the really quick editing between like the crazy party scene and then it would cut to a still quiet moment and then crazy editing the 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 worst one for me and the one that i'm still not i still don't like is after he kills himself after Brad Pitt kills himself and then it cuts to Manny running into the house and it's just the music. Oh, see, going. I think that might be my favorite one. I don't. I love a good I jump think cut. That, yeah. I think that's my favorite one, actually. Uh, I, I'm <laughs> because more, because I, to me, can I tell you yeah, why? Yeah, no, sure. Because I love that one specifically because to me it's like, oh, we've just basically watched Brad Pitt's Jack Conrad kill himself. Mm. And then in this industry... They don't have time to mourn. They don't have time yeah, to think about yeah. it. Like mm-hmm. there's Fair. a death and then it's like, nope, next thing, go, 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 go. Like yeah. you've got your okay. own stuff going on. Like it's just to I'll me, it's like one. it fits the theme. To me, it's the like, oh, how sad. No, I'll give you. <laughs> like, I, you know what? I'll give you that one. Um, no, that's fair. Actually, uh, that's, I, just, that's just how I saw it. No, I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just telling you. No, that's how I see it. Yeah, that's. Don't I, gaslight yourself, Jacob. <laughs> just, don't victimize yourself here. I'm just trying to explain. Think your own thoughts, but that's a good thought. <laughs> no, that I no, I I will give you that one. That one's that makes a lot of sense. Actually, that I really like that. Um, but anyway, I do agree with you. It's very jarring, mm. like the way that he's chosen deliberately to do those kind of cuts throughout yeah. the film. Mm-hmm. It, and it's it may it was it took me. I think that was the thing that I had to really process the first time, and I think it also made the film feel longer the first time. Whereas in the second time, it really like, oh, this is flowing. This is going by really quick. Um, That first scene about how they make movies in like how the, yeah. when we get the whole sequence with Margot Robbie into cut with Brad, with Brad Pitt and uh, Spike Jones and yeah. oh, they're making, I, that is, I think, the best representation I have ever seen of just the manic chaoticness that is Hollywood. Yeah. And I loved every single second of that whole sequence because the first hour of this movie, even the first time I saw it, I was just like, this is, oh my God, this could be one of the best movies of the, like, this is amazing. I absolutely like that whole first hour is incredible. And I really, really appreciated that whole sequence of just how, like, again, and also how drunk Brad Pitt is on set, and he's they are just completely wasted writing the script for Gone with the like trying to rewrite Gone with the Wind, and um, uh, and then you know getting to the top of the mountain, completely hammered, not being able to really do it, and then going action, and he gives them, and and then we see he gives the performance, yeah. And I just am like, that is Hollywood. That sums it up perfectly. And I just... It's a wonder they made any films back then. No, oh, yeah. The, the, the cut to the dead guy was like, yes. oh, he ran into a stick. <laughs> <laughs> he had a drinking problem. Yeah. <laughs> I just... The chaoticness and you feel like... And there's pe- but it, it's chaotic. But the direct, it's always in control. Oh, like yeah. it never yeah. feels like Controlled it's chaos, out of yeah. control of Damien Chazelle. No, yeah. Damien Chazelle presents, he's able, like, we completely, like, sorry, when I send the craziness, I no, mean, no, I just yeah, want to make sure yeah. that, like, yeah. I want to get you to elaborate on it mm. because I get what you're trying to say, but I want to make sure we're yeah, pointing the, out the craziness of what being on set. So, Cause it feels like they're in an actual battle yeah. and they're, they're like, this guy's bleeding and you're going, is, is he bleeding for real? Or is he, is that fake? Or like, 
is he like? Are they in an actual infirmary or w- what's going but on? But then also here? the flip side of like when they have to get a new camera and everyone's just so, sitting, yeah. <laughs> waiting in the sun. <laughs> oh, that it's just epic. Yeah. The that whole sequence just feels so authentic as yeah. well. Like you just sit there and you're like, this feels like what it would have been like and just absolute. Well, and, and it's like, it's the same with when we see Margot Robbie's side of it too, right? Yeah. Where it's like the set like catches on fire and they're like, keep rolling. Yep. Just keep up. Nope, just the, nothing's on fire. Like it's fine. <laughs> but also like when she, like her way into it, where it's just like. I can act. Well, not even that, but just like they just have to find somebody, yeah, because they just they're in Mexico and they need somebody, and she's dancing on a bar, yeah, and they hand her a card, and she gets there, and the director's like, "I guess, like, let's put her into makeup and see what the <laughs> hell is gonna happen." Like, it's just every part of it is mm. so chaotic. Like you said, how do how do they even get movies made? Like even with. Just silent movies. Like, how did they yeah. get anything made? Because <laughs> yeah. everything was on fire. Horses were destroying cameras. Like, Brad almost got speared in the head while he's on the phone. Like, it's <laughs> there's just... There's no, there's no, like, visual effects back then, guys. No, <laughs> it's, it's... It's all real. Yeah, it, it's absolutely sensational how they film this whole sequence. And at the end of it... And what I... And, yeah, what I really love... Overall, what this whole movie is building to is the love of cinema, that it's worth it, that despite everything. So and, everything you just saw and yeah. every, like, chaotic, crazy, absolutely just, like, vile thing you just saw. It's, like, it's worth it because in the end you get, you get and, they, they, and in the end they show it. They show that shot of the, 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 sorry, and at the end of that sequence when they're um, – filming the movie you get the seat the shot of him kissing kissing her and that's it and you're like there's the power of cinema and mm-hmm. like that whole narrative is constantly reinforced through the whole film until the final shot and i think the final shot is i the final shot is perfect mm-hmm. i think it's the best final shot well let's not jump yeah. that far no ahead. let's not go there yet <laughs> um i do think that the first there are a couple of very minor exceptions, but the first 15 to 20 minutes are as visually gross as the movie gets. Like, if you can get through, like, the first 15, 20 minutes, yeah. you're yeah. pretty solid. It's probably that. something where it does that to be like, guys, this is what, which Chazelle does that a lot. He's like, yeah. guys, this is what kind of movie it is. Yeah. If you don't like it, get out, get your refunds now. Yeah. Because <laughs> I only want people in this cinema who are actually going to appreciate what this is. Yeah. No, because, yeah, outside, outside of, like, the man eating the rat and then the rattlesnake. That's it. Like they're, they're Everything just, else is pretty, pretty tame. Vis- visually, like, not disgusting. Like, yeah. Except for that. It just hits you in the... It's a one-two punch at the opening. Oh, yeah. yeah. For, for sure. Yeah, because you get the... You can- Get an elephant shitting all over you, yes. and then oh, that was that. Ca- I was like, oh, okay. And then, and then two seconds later, you get w- woman peeing on guy. It's like, oh, okay, all and right. That get, is where we're and at. And then you get the most nudity I've ever seen in my entire life <laughs> in that kind of movie. Yep, just like every- everyone, and like they're not. I I think I was listening to an interview with Margot, and she's like, mm. I'm pretty sure. Those were real porn stars and people were actually having sex next to us. She's like, I'm pretty sure that's actually what was happening. And uh, we all just had to remind each other to just be careful where you're walking and what you're touching and what's going on. Like, <laughs> Oh, God. But oh yeah, like that, that whole opening sequence is so manic yeah. and chaotic and just so... And just... But like... <sighs> I think it, you know, there is the element of this is fun, but also you're meant to be like, this is, this is disgusting. Mm. Like, I don't think you're meant, it, uh, Wolf of Wall Street has it, but it's meant to be like, hey, this is fun. This is glamorous. Like, but it's, it's fun and over the top, but you're also meant to be like, whoa, this guy's, this guy's not good. This is you definitely meant to be like, oh, this isn't good. Like, this isn't meant. You're not meant to enjoy this. You can obviously uh, watch it, and the way that Margot, because we kind of, 
kind of see it through Margot Robbie's eyes, especially when she walks in and she's like enamored by the room yeah. that she's in and wants to steal the show straight away. But she, I do agree that like there's a part of you that is meant to kind of see it cautiously. Mm. Um and not completely give in to the, oh, my God, I wish I was at a party like this in 1920s Hollywood because um, that's, like, the whole point of the movie. Mm. Like you said, hate letter to Hollywood. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I disagree with you. Mm. Yeah. I think the whole point of Margot Robbie's character is we're supposed to be enamored by it and we're supposed to wish we were there. Okay. I think Diego's character gives us the other side of it. Yeah. Saying yeah. that this is shit as he's trying to figure out how to sneak someone out the back that's OD'd. Yeah. And he's the one that has to work it and doesn't really get to enjoy the glamour of it. Like he, mm. part of him enjoys being there, but part of him like knows what the other side of it looks like because he has to work it. Yeah. True. And- I think that's why I ha- I'm like conflicted on that because you see Margot Robbie and every, like she's dancing and it's like the whole thing and then cuts to whatever Diego's doing and it's like, oh, my God, they're carrying out a dead body and there's sweaty old man and, yeah. like, you know. So I think that he, he really, Damien really effectively gives us the dichotomy of it, mm-hmm. of the person who's so enamored by it and just wants to be part of that crowd, wants to be in the movies, wants to be in that scene that – it's she kind of doesn't care mm. about just how gross it is or how like wild it is. Whereas his side of it is more like, yeah, he wants to be a part of it, but he very clearly goes, Hey, next time, can I be on set <laughs> instead of being here? Yeah. Like, which is kind of fascinating. Um, uh, what did you guys think of Lady Faye and Sydney's stories? Taylor. I'm being Cause volunteered. Per, Cause per, okay, personally, they're the two that I question why. Well, I, under, I, I don't know if I question why because I think I know why and it's because you want. I think he wants to tell minority stories at yeah. the same time um, so that it's not just about white people in Hollywood. That's fair. <laughs> um, and I appreciated kind of, especially because Lady Faye was queer as well, mm. I am kind of appreciated the inclusion of that i also don't know if it's it didn't like say anything wonderful about the fact that they are in hollywood and what their roles as a an asian and a black person are in hollywood at Mm. that time um sydney it kind of did not as much lady Faye. yeah i also didn't exactly appreciate most of the time how her queerness was being told but Mm. i guess it's in telling with the movie yeah like I get why it's like that. Um, But yeah, I don't know. See, I don't think it was about representation at all, Mm. to be honest. Um, I think her story was... I think her story was very intentional. I think her story was... Queerness was acceptable to an extent as long as it was how they wanted it. So before morality really worked its way into things and, and they were trying to clean it up, it was very much... You can come to this party and give us this quote unquote exotic queer kind of thing, Mm. right? Like it was more of a, they wanted the performative side of it. They wanted to feel maybe it was a bit naughty. That's kind of what I got out of her place there was she was used as, she was employed. She was used as the entertainment. Yeah. Like her being a queer and going to find a partner for the night and kissing women was used as entertainment. Mm. Mm. Like she wasn't there to be herself authentically. She was there to get paid to be provocative. Mm. So like to me, that's important because then as we get into the part of the movie that they're having to clean everybody up and then morals are becoming important when she gets fired, it's like, see, we didn't really care about you and representing queers and representing like, it was never about that. It was, we can use you and exploit you to be our entertainment because that's how we see you. We Mm. see women kissing women as entertainment yeah. and Rather as something than... that excites us and that was to me the point of that which really was like being like yeah hollywood back then still not great now but back then was really sucked mm-hmm. like that was the only way you were going to be accepted mm-hmm. kind of and even then you weren't really being accepted it was more like how can we benefit 
from this. Yeah. Um, and then when she gets fired, it's like really tough. It's really like, so not only do they see it as, as immoral and something that they need to get rid of mm. and not, they can't even employ her just for quote unquote fun or entertainment anymore. Mm. Like it's just like completely unacceptable at that point, which I think tells you a lot about where Hollywood was at that point in time. When it comes to Sydney's story, I think his was more, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but his to me was, he is clearly more talented than probably most people in any room that he walks into. Mm. Like he's very clearly the guy. Um, and when we see him interact with Diego Calva's character that first time with the singing in the rain sequence, and he says, what do you think? He says, the camera's facing the wrong way. Does having that idea ultimately benefit him? Sure. Does he get credited really for having that idea? Mm. Does he really make money off of the fact that it was his idea? Does he get the studio executive position from having that idea? No. Like, it benefits him because it puts him on camera. But to me, it's a commentary on minorities not actually getting credit for their ideas. And not really... Like, it was just... Yeah. Like, just kind of... that. That's at least what I got from that. But also, I think it's very much about... Because by, by the end of his arc, we get him deciding to walk away from it um, and going back to just playing in these small little clubs. Because to him, having to put blackface on to make himself blacker mm. was not... What do you want to Was like, not worth it to him. Yeah. Like, he, I think, is the one character we probably see in the whole film that has a line. Mm-hmm. Who, who decides that the quote-unquote whatever it costs does not work for him. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else is willing to say, this is what I want and whatever it takes to get it, even if it means I end up dead. Mm. Like, that's worth the cost for me. For him, that's not that's not his story which I think is fascinating because unless I'm forgetting someone, he's literally the only one Yeah, that that picks a different yeah. path. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, that's, that's a good take. Um, so okay, let's, do you want to talk about your experience with this movie? Oh, uh, I can. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm ready to be absolutely roasted by everyone listening to this, but it's fine. So, <laughs> First time I watched the movie, I hadn't seen Singing in the Rain. So I watched it with the perspective of not understanding any of the Singing in the Rain references, except for at the very end, when it's very clear that Singing in the Rain is, it's like literally on the screen. Yeah. Like he's literally watching the movie on the screen. So watching it the second time, because I watched Babylon, came home, watched Singing in the Rain, woke up the next day and watched Babylon again. <laughs> and I do think that... As much as I enjoyed Babylon without having seen Singing in the Rain, I definitely think it helps a whole lot to have that kind of touchstone of what exactly has given Chazelle so much inspiration to make this. Mm. Because it's very clearly, even though the tone is wildly different and it has a far more masochistic take on the kind of story that Singing in the Rain is telling, it's clearly he's taken that movie and gone, bam, like... This is it's his glorified this remake. Is, this is my yeah. This is my version of it, I suppose. Where it's um, and and to me, you can you can appreciate pretty much the whole movie almost the exact same amount, except for the very end, because at the very end, when Diego's character is getting really emotional, it makes sense without it, but with it, when you're seeing the story because there's so many scenes in Babylon that are pretty much remakes of scenes from Singing in the Rain. Yeah. And so when Singing in the Rain is playing and he's watching it and having this big emotional epiphany kind of moment, it really works a lot better mm. when you actually understand those things. Yeah. Cause to me, like I didn't pick up any references. Like none of like I didn't sit there the first time I watched it and pick up on anything that was from Singing in the Rain. It's and like and I think that was another reason why I was a little standoffish the first time I saw it. 
is because of how much I love singing in the rain. And I was just sitting there like, this is a, like, I've seen this. I've seen that. Like, and it just, but, and it felt, and it, I think the ending where it's like, no, we get it. Like that there is a reason we did this kind of, it justifies it. But as you're watching the movie, it was very off putting for me. Like, oh, oh, you're li- like, you're just taking from those scenes. Like, straight up directly from singing in the rain and redoing it like it just very much felt like a singing in the rain remake for most of the movie in terms of like some like what they were touching upon but then at the end of the film it's like there's a reason and it's like oh okay cool i i I get it now especially on a rewatch it hits a lot harder um so yeah like so when you talk about when we talk about you know your the probably your your favorite scene of the movie which is the the sound the sound mm. stage yep. that is a beat for beat remake of singing in the rain which i didn't know yeah i no. just thought it was a hilarious scene yeah the first time i saw Neither it did I. I mean i've seen sing, singing in the rain mm. but in dance class in year nine <laughs> that's because we watched we did like one of the dances in it and then we yeah. went and saw the stage show and i yeah. fell asleep the whole time i i yeah i need to rewatch it i guess but <laughs> I yeah, so like that whole sequence it's don't get me wrong, it's hilarious and it is so well made and it's just absolutely perfectly sums up just the chaos and mess that would have been going from s- silent to sound and just how big of a disaster it most likely was. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was tough for me as someone who really loves that, the, the, the uh, singing in the rain, watching this going, I've, I've seen this and you are blatantly ripping it off. <laughs> um, Fair um, but you no, know, like, so but is it ripping it off? Like, like, is it more of an ode to it or is it, is he just trying to like remake it and it, you don't appreciate it that much? The first time I saw it. Yeah, that's how I felt. The yeah. the like, it di- I didn't feel like it was an ode. It didn't feel like this was like a love. Like, um, what's the name? The Daniels doing one car wide. Like, it wasn't. Yeah, that. It, it didn't was just feel like that. Authentic. It, it felt like the the first time I saw it, it felt like I'm being sneaky. I I'm being right. I'm being cheeky and I'm being sneaky. But then I get why. Like, because the ending just the, the ending is the thing that goes. This is why, mm. like, be, uh, so it's hard when you're watching the movie and you don't know where it's going. Yeah, yeah, like, so uh, that's I'm just trying to give you that was my perspective on it the first time, and that's why I think the second time I've just fallen in love with this movie so much, mm. and why I'm like I'm completely on board. Um, so like going through, is there any other scenes you guys really want to like jump on and talk about? Um. I guess there's one I could talk about that kind of ties into something else I wanted to bring up Mm -hmm. that we haven't talked about yet. Um, There's a scene uh, where Margot Robbie's character comes to Diego Calva for help. Mm. Uh, She comes banging on the door in presumably the middle of the night um, to ask for help because she has all these gambling debts. And it's a really pivotal moment in the movie where his character where Manny is just so done with her at that point like he's tried to help her so many times and he just doesn't feel like she's trying to help herself and like she really appreciates him for the friend that he's been this whole time and we know that he's basically been in love with her this whole time Mm -hmm. as well which doesn't help things but he just loses it and he starts screaming at her in Spanish and there are no subtitles to it I love that they're very particular with when they give us subtitles when Spanish Mm. is used because it's probably about a third of the time like Mm. when Spanish is used that you actually get subtitles as to what's being said. And we, Jacob and I talked about this earlier, probably a a little annoying to some people. To me, I think it's perfect. I think when it's not giving you the subtitles, it's telling you that the specific words he's saying aren't important. It's how he's saying them, the context of the situation. Like, you can figure out what's being conveyed without having to 100% understand Mm. what he's saying. Yeah. And I thought it was such a great stylistic and storytelling choice 
personally, I wish there wasn't any at all. But I'm a fucking weirdo, so that's <laughs> fine. Like I'll leave that. But but I just really appreciate the way that English and Spanish is kind of used and flipped and interchanged throughout the movie. Like a lot of the time when he's talking, he's going between both. Um, and I just think it's such a cool choice that we don't really see a lot of in like big movies. It's either one or the other. Um, it's either you know an international foreign film with the Spanish language, or it's just in a movie in English where all the characters are expected to only speak English. Mm. So I really thought that was cool. Um, I agree. I really love when movies have that stylistic choice of not including subtitles when someone just not randomly, but just like starts talking in a different language if it's in an English film. Um, Cause you're right. Like I've never known why I like it, but you just like summed it up. It's like, you just hear it from the tone and you can figure out so much from how an actor is saying something. Yeah. Which I think is again, credit to Diego because he yeah. nailed it. Like yeah. you didn't actually need to know what he was saying yeah. in that scene to know like what he was feeling. You'd really love the Godfather. Cause there's a whole sequence. When they- <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the motherfucking Godfather. Jacob, Sorry. I just had, had to. I Jacob, know, I- Jacob. <laughs> I saw I'm my opportunity and I had to take it. This heartfelt moment where I'm talking about <laughs> the importance of bilingual. <sighs> so I saw an opportunity and I had to take it. You're like, this is an opportunity for me to remind everyone how much Elena hates the Godfather. I don't hate the Godfather. That's I, anyway, I, this is not the Godfather podcast. I completely. <laughs> I'm in so much trouble right now. Um, <laughs> no, I completely agree with you though. Like I, I no, you're right in that he, you completely understand everything through his performance and yeah, context matters. And I love when films trust an audience to just follow context and yeah. Mm-hmm. I like it when movies assume their list, listeners, what, Audience, that's the word. <laughs> Assume their audience are smart enough. Yeah, they're, they're intelligent and yes. they can actually follow <laughs> the things that are happening on screen and they can understand what is happening. Guy um, Ritchie. <laughs> <laughs> um, one, okay, so one thing that I want to, like, mention that I was a little disappointed that we never got, and we get we get it, but we don't get them on screen together doing it, and I'm – is we don't get the final scene between Jack and Diego. Halfway through the film, we get a phone call, and that's the last time that they're on screen together. Mm. It's when, it is when – well, sorry, there is one other scene that they're on, that, together when it's at the party. But they and don't really talk they, to each other. J- Jack and Manny literally run into each other, t- see each other, and then keep moving, mm. and that's the last time that they are on screen together. But yep. the, the the scene where Jack says goodbye to, to Manny because he's left MGM and gone to Kino – and he's uh, is hey, good luck. I'm glad you did. I I just yeah. I would have liked to have had that on screen, like to get them together doing it. But I also get that that's to go with the hot the thing theme of what the movie is probably trying to say of hey, relationships end, they go, they move on. So I get it. I just from like a drama point of view, it's like especially I back liked. then when we can't just text each other and stuff. <laughs> yeah, <It's> like, like <laughs> they don't have time to go visit the set or like find their schedules just aren't working out mm-hmm. or or yeah. they assume they'll always have another time to to get Not around sure. to it. Yeah, no. I, so, um, I okay. So let's let's get on to other scenes that I just love. <laughs> I really want to just talk about um, Gene Smart's monologue about legacy again another film about legacy i the, this year and legacy is f- just covid just fucked everyone up yeah. <laughs> like, i don't know how much time i have i just need to <laughs> i'm dealing with my legacy what is the what am i leaving and um mm-hmm, yeah. the the amount of stuff that they're talking about but i i that the line of and you know a hundred years from now we'll all be ghosts on a screen i just mm-hmm. I think I think the the that whole monologue is great, but I think the line that really hit me was, you know, there'll be you know fifty years from now there'll be a kid that watches you on the screen that feels like he knows you when he took his first breath far long after you took your last. Yeah, and I was like, oh wow, (laughs) oh my gosh, we're not even breathing at the same time. (laughs) Like I just. yeah, that whole monologue was 
insane. She is brilliant. Yeah. But also, yeah, just just the idea of dealing with legacy and in that specific situation where he is dealing with the fact that his career might actually be over. Like his time has come and gone and Hollywood has kind of passed him by. Mm. Um and the silent era was kind of his thing. Yeah. Um which is interesting because when she talks to him a couple scenes before when he's like, no, I don't want ever, I don't want to impede. She says, do you miss the silence? And he says, no, I don't want to impede progress. Yeah. Which is just like. <sighs> I mean, like he he embodies that. Because yeah, he he embodies that like person who was I wanted, you know, I, I, I wanted to change Hollywood. I wanted to keep keep it moving forward. And it did just without, without him. him. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, it's just, yeah, that's, it's such a crazy, like, cause that's definitely the turning point for his character in the movie, mm-hmm. that conversation. Yeah. Like he's never the same after that conversation. No. And it's really interesting how like Chazelle brings in characters like Gene Smart and Tobey Maguire and they have not much screen time, but mm-hmm. when they do have that screen time, it basically changes the characters, like the main character's path. Yeah. Like completely. Mm. Um, because like Gene, really smart. I, I like that Gene Smart's like peppered throughout the film. Yeah. Like she's always there. She's um, you know, the the whole time you're she's always in the background covering the event. Mm. Um, and then she gets her scene that she absolutely nails. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that 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 sequence I think is probably the most heartbreaking moment. And I'm gonna go on my tangent because that's when it happens. This is the thing that I caught and I'm going to be, and I don't care if I'm the only person who's, who thinks this. I, so the score for this film, Mm. again, I cannot get it out of my head for the last three days. It's been in my head the last three days and I can't get it out of my head. I absolutely love this score. There is three scenes in this movie. It happens three times. It's when George dies. It's when he, um, it's when Jack has the conversation with um, Eleanor, and it's uh, and it's when um, uh, Nellie leaves. Three times it plays. Oh, well, I can't remember what the name of the the track is, but it's um, it it play it it plays three times through the film. And every single and it has this like little, the same score. It's the same score. It, yeah. it, well, it 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 sounds the same. I could be wrong, but right. it plays these in these three specific moments. And each time it has a couple of uh, this little chords that at the end of a La La Land song. I think it was. I think I caught it as well. And I kept thinking that's. I think it's the um, like in regards to the La La Land what it is for La La Land. I think it's this like extended bit of somewhere in the, someone in the it's, crowd. Yeah. It's from somewhere. It yeah. is from someone in the crowd. And, but, uh, the, the La, the, sorry. Uh, it's called Gold Coast Rhythm. Yeah. Jack's part. And it play, that's the one yeah. that's, that is, that's, that's played. I think it's intentional. I think it is intentionally in there mm. to link La La, the, the, to link La La Land and the optimism because I, I think this is that Babylon as a whole is a response to La La Land and the quote unquote criticism that it's an idealized version of Hollywood. Mm. Hey, all right, here is the real Hollywood. And I think using music from that part, that song specifically, which is the longing to be noticed song. And then having it play in the three points where these guys have regret, not regretting, but at the end of being noticed, I think is intentional and is about saying it is Damien Chazelle saying being noticed isn't always the best. I s- kind of agree with you, but I also I hear La La Land like 10 times, in like 10 <laughs> different scores, probably just because Justin Hurwitz does yeah. both scores and he probably uses the same kind of instruments and the same kind of progressions because that's his score. Like you could listen to any most like score makers. Mm. I don't know what they're called. Oh, composers. That's them. <laughs> <laughs> hold, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Oh, oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Oh. I fucking hate myself. Oh my god. Composers. 
was. <laughs> That's so embarrassing. Okay, anyway, I just worked 10 hours today. Don't come at me. <sighs> Composers, not school makers. <sighs> anyway, as I was saying... <laughs> Composers said, I can't, I can't, we just have to move on. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll take over. Point I was trying to make. Um, I, I think that um, Horowitz definitely has a distinctive chord, chord progressions he likes to use and distinctive instruments he likes to use. And I do think composers do that for sure. Like I think <clears throat> there are a lot of composers out there where you can listen to different scores they've put out and you can tell that it's by the same person. Yeah. But I don't think I disagree with you because the third time it happens that you're talking about, both times, I definitely went, that has to be somewhere, someone in the crowd. Mm -hmm. Like, at least that one time, like the last time, is when I notice it the most. Because there are moments throughout the rest of the movie and the rest of the score where I'm like, oh yeah, like that's a chord progression or like a kind of instrument like he likes to use. Because he does have a very distinctive style, mm. I think. But I do think that last one, for sure, I I hear it at least. And maybe, maybe it is just you and I like pulling it out mm. because he does use the same kind of style. But I do like your theory. Like I think it works mm. for sure, especially with all the crap he had to deal with after La La Land came out. Yeah, because you either had people who loved it and were so happy that we were getting musicals again and. It was, even though it has a really bittersweet ending, it was still like this big love letter to Hollywood and and to following your dreams and and what that kind of looks like in this bright, vivid kind of world. Yeah. And then he had to deal with people going like, well, that's a super idealized version of it and Hollywood's not like that and, you know, whatever else, like, oh, this white man doing jazz, like, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) all the crap he had to deal with after La La Land, this definitely feels like a swing of the pendulum in the complete other direction. Yeah, this movie feels like, it, it definitely feels like we never would have gotten this had, honestly, La La Land won Best Picture, Easily, like if it had been the renowned favorite, the beloved film that everyone just loved and there was no backlash or criticism. I don't know if he writes this. I don't know if he has this film that he's like, okay, I need to tell. I want to tell the story of a of a of the true Hollywood because I feel like, yeah, he did get criticism for, for La La Land and the idealized version of it. And he probably took some of that personally on like a filmmaking level yeah. as well. Not not just from an ideological standpoint, mm. but also, you know, it was a very bright kind of <clears throat> almost quote unquote cheesy kind of, you know, musical. Like that, that movie feels more like actual singing in the rain. Mm. Than this movie does. This mm-hmm. movie feels like he looked at singing in the rain and went, "That's not fucking how." Ha- nope, <laughs> nope. You guys want it dark? All right, let's fucking do it. Like Justin, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> come on. But no, if if I ever get the chance to interview Justin or Damien, I am asking that question. I don't you like. Better. It'll be you ten better. years from now, and I'm gonna be like, "So this movie Babylon that they're like, You're like we don't talk next about that plane anymore." One day or yeah. something. Like that. You're like, Surprise! <laughs> they're like, we don't talk about Babylon because it's his one flop or something. He just he never talks well, about it. <laughs> to be fair, it would have to be grouped with First Man. Well, yeah, sorry, unfortunately, okay, fair, yeah, fair enough. And I, yeah, <laughs> I. Um, He's like, you can only ask me questions about La La Land and Whiplash exclusively. <laughs> I don't answer questions about it's anything his, else. It's his David Lynch's Dune. Yeah. <laughs> nope. um, okay, let's let's talk about the ending. Well, the the bit that I have that I think is too long that doesn't work for me. All and right, it's, and it's I get why Tobey Maguire sequence is in this movie because you have to get Manny out of L.A. Plus, you also want to show how dark Hollywood gets. Yeah, because and I understand all of it. At that point in the film, though, we're getting too long, I think. I think at that point it's starting to drag and that whole sequence just drags on for me and I don't – and I get the tension building and I get the whole point. You're sitting there with this bomb of he's going to find the money. He is going to figure this out and they're going to die. Mm. I just – it's just a little too drawn out for me. 
Look, <clears throat> if there's anyone here on the planet that is always for Tobey Maguire slander, <laughs> it is me specifically. However, I do think the sequence itself is necessary. I don't know if it needed to be that long. So, like, when they're sitting there and he's selling his movie ideas, I don't think that scene needs to be that long. Yeah. I think the important part isn't that. The important part is the creepy L.A.'s asshole club that <laughs> that he brings yeah. them to. Like, that's the important part, because that's when you're feeling all of the... Not only is it a callback and a... It's a callback to the beginning of the movie, but it's also a representation of the people in Hollywood who are going to cling on to what Hollywood was at the beginning of the movie, mm. no matter what. Like, yeah. they will go into this dark, creepy tunnel system below the city to hold on to the Hollywood that they love, mm. that quote-unquote doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I do think that part of the movie is important. I, I think there are other th things. Like, I think you could chop five minutes from other scenes throughout the movie. And then keep most of that. Mm. Like, I think their conversation is too long before they get dragged to that place. Mm. Like, I think that goes on for too long. But for the ending to really, not the actual ending, but the first ending yeah. to really hit, I think you have to have that sequence. Because I was sitting there going, they're going to fucking die. Yeah, uh, Like, they yeah. are going to get shot in the head. They are never making it out of this creepy tunnel system. Mm. Like, they are going to die. I get why it's there. Like, I can... And, and I think the tension build... I, I think maybe reveal that it's fake money earlier then. Because we because it's after the... Con you're right. It's after the conversation that he gives them the film ideas and everything. They reveal... I Maybe they, re they reveal that it's fake too late. Because at that point, like, the tension of he's going to find that this is fake starts once they leave mm, yeah i get what you're trying to say yeah yeah where, where he turns and he says it's fake it's the prop money and then he goes what and then like oh if we're they going said that at the start yeah the whole thing you would have been like sweating yeah, yeah like as he gives it to him and then they're walking up and he says yeah it's the prop money yeah. what like we just given and then it you to him, him. And it, yeah. like yeah like then maybe because you're sitting there this whole time with dread of war where it's like they can't focus on anything he's so, the word that's coming out of his yeah. mouth the entire time because yeah and like maybe that maybe that would make what he's that that whole sequence of where it's being elongated feel less like oh god i need to get out of here like it's dread of oh god i need to keep him talking because if he's talking, he's not going to check the money. Mm. Um, so maybe that. Uh, but that's just me. Like that's really the only big criticism that I have is that fun is that sequence just goes on for too long for me personally. I I think my one sequence that I'm not a hundred percent sold on. Like I'm with you where I kind like I get why it's there, but I don't know if I love that it's there. Um, even though it gives our characters an excuse to all be in the same room together again. I don't think I like the party, like the fancy the aristocratic party. Yeah. Like I don't personally gain anything out of that scene and I don't know if our characters really do either. I think more of it is, I think what it's trying to say is achieved 10 minutes earlier with Brad Pitt's speech. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think I think what it's trying to say about the uppity class trying to get into Hollywood and and Hollywood trying to appeal to the upper class and and get away from the quote unquote working man and the yeah scum uh, like the way yeah. that 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 it views you know I think what that is trying to achieve works better with Brad Pitt's speech of you make you know a hundred thousand people see your play and it's the smash of the year a hundred thousand people see our stuff and i'm out of a job like it's yeah. i get i think that that scene is more powerful and, but i also understand why because you start it's the first you're seeing her really try but yeah i i, I agree like with it's you. not my favorite like i don't hate it like i think it's it works with the tone of the film and it works with her character like it's it's really showing us that she just can't do it. Yeah. Like she's kind of trying to fit in with upper class society, but she just doesn't have it in her to do it. And mm. I get that. But I think to me, that's like the one sequence where I'm like, I could take it or leave it. Mm. Like, you know, that's fine. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, um, I didn't really have a scene that was like, I mean, I gave it five stars. So. <laughs> I don't really have a scene that I didn't like, but I definitely agree with both of your points. Um, that there are things that I guess could have been honed in a little bit and a little bit more fine-tuned, but I also do appreciate, like, like he made a three-hour epic that is just, yeah. like, yeah. balls balls to the wall, like, just giving everything he's got and it works. Yeah, like, the – again, like, I, I could have done with 20 minutes – cut here or there i don't know exactly like there isn't a here is a 20 minute sequence that you completely cut mm. there is one minute here one minute there one minute there maybe or like five minutes yeah. a bit towards the end or like there, there's things of like hey let's try and maybe tighten this a little bit maybe but i that's getting nitpicky ex- yeah, yeah it is like, like it's-, it, it's a three hour film like i yeah you know yeah and i'm again i just i'm not the biggest fan of three hour movies um all right Let's just talk about the ending ending because I I think the most the, – there are two most powerful shots in the film is the one of the audience. Mm. I think that is the most important shot of the film mm-hmm. because it shows that it's everyone. It's not just Manny and then obviously Manny crying. Uh, Manny smiling at the very end. Um, him seeing, singing in the rain and walking in and then the – basically we get that montage of the history of cinema – is amazing and incredible. I had the cheesiest smile on my face. I was just like, this is just, oh, I was obsessed with that. <laughs> my favorite, my The funniest part I've thought about that whole thing was people walking out thinking it was the end of the movie. So, oh, I my God. I couldn't believe it. I was like, it. get your asses down on those seats. <laughs> Stop walking in front of the screen. Appreciate this shit. Maybe they were just, like, sick of the movie. Maybe they didn't like it and they were like, this is my opportunity to leave. <laughs> But my God, my, honestly, the funniest part about that sequence though is the <laughs> when Avatar, <laughs> the Avatar's like little snippet. I was like, the fuck. <laughs> I do love that they the Avatar's where they ended. They didn't show anything from Marvel. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, yeah, uh, there's yeah, a yeah. little bit of me that's like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's just that's just me personally. I'm, <laughs> I'm like really happy that Damien uh, Chazelle is on Martin Scorsese's yeah. side. <laughs> They're just like Hollywood ended with Avatar. <laughs> like Hollywood, ho, ho, Avatar was where Hollywood just went. This is the epitome of what we have done so far. <laughs> this is actually it. There was no movie made yeah. after this. <laughs> oh nine was the end. <laughs> um, no, I yeah, I, I really do love that the history of cinema part. I, I I think that that's really great. And then the freaking the hey, if you have epilepsy. Good luck. I'm very sorry. <laughs> Whole sequence where they're just like every single color, like the you know red, uh, mm. red, green, blue, like to yeah. show trying to like printing film yeah. and oh that whole sequence was just perfect. Yeah, I I loved it was the, all just of the it. perfect way to encapsulate the whole movie. Yeah, and, and just and like if you didn't get the point of this, this is it. Yeah, exactly. Like hey, and here it's is such an indirect. It's direct, but it's also like not shoving it in your face, like telling you exactly what it yeah. is. Like, it's like, if you either get this or you don't. Yeah. No, so. I, I love this movie. I really do. I can't wait to see it again. Same. I'm going to try and go see it again at some point in the get next pissed. couple of weeks. <laughs> get pissed and go see it again. But yeah, I, uh, uh any, any final thoughts, Taylor? Uh, any no. other scenes you guys want to talk about? Like I kind We've of jump, jumped around. Everything. <laughs> yeah, I just think. I mean, we kind of skipped over the act, like the actual ending of the movie. But no, okay. So, like, oh, when like with Margot being like Margot dying and well, she doesn't. We don't know she well, dies there. No, yeah, excuse fair. me. Sorry, we don't, <laughs> no, that's fair. Sorry, but yeah, the, when um they get back to the ha- the apartment. And what's his name? And the two friends get the two, the roommate. No, you're skipping the important which, part again. Which part? That Sorry. is not the important Sorry, part. Sorry, which part? I'm, I'm an idiot then. Which part? Yes, you are. Thank you. <laughs> the important part is when they decide to leave together. Oh, okay. Okay. The important part is she knows it's the end of the line for her. And he is trying everything he can to convince her that it's not. 
And even though she agrees to it, I don't think she believes it for a second that she's making it to Mexico. Mm. Like, I just think it's such a, like, she allows herself to have that, like, what I'm thinking she considers her last kind of moment. Like, she lets herself have that because she knows. Like, that's why she chooses to stay in the car. Yeah. To me. Like, to me, she chooses to stay in the car because she can slip away. Mm. And she is in that moment, slowly walking away, taking in that the, it's out of her hands at that point. Like, she's accepted it, is what it is, whereas she knows that he's not like that. Mm. Like, she is very much, he needs to get out of here. He's going to keep going. This is not the end of the line for him. But I just think they're such, like, in mentally and emotionally completely different places in that point. But it's just, like, the one moment in the movie, like, kind of lets you, like, slow down and have a moment with the two of them, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I loved that moment, too. Yeah. No, I did. I, I loved that that sequence. And I and it's, yeah, I, I think it is heartbreaking of having where he, you know, they get to the car, the, they get to the apartment and she's, yeah, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm walking off. And and he gets it into the car and is like, "Where is she? Where is she?" And then just goes, "I'm I'm gonna die. I'm out of here." Yeah, yeah. Sad. Yeah, like the it is the the ending of it. The ending is bittersweet in the you know, like obviously, yeah, we get the we get the the montage of Eleanor dying and then of being dying at seventy six and then her. I, I you know I also found it. F- Interesting, you know, Jack gets the big front page. Yeah. Eleanor gets a big section of, hey, Hollywood icon, and hers is a small, tiny one mm. on, like, page three of silent silent film star. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, any final final thoughts? Uh, not really. J- Justin and Damien just are – power couple for the ages and they just need to keep directing and composing together that's my last it's my last note on that keep being iconic honestly both of them yeah i agree um i'm just after this and how absolutely like damien chazelle just like cemented himself as one of our greats i am just ready for whatever else he wants to make yeah, because this was the one, like I said, like worried, <laughs> scared, not hopeful. But after this, I'm like, do whatever you want. If like I don't have much money, but if you need money somehow, I'll give it to you somehow. I will get a loan out. Just do whatever. <laughs> uh, his next thing's a drama series. That's going to be interesting. Drama series. Yes, for Apple TV. What about? No idea. So cool. No other information has been released. Great. <laughs> so. We'll see. Uh, guys, that has been our uh, Babylon discussion. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Elena, where can they pe- find you online? You can find me on Letterboxd and Instagram at Elena Violet. And you can find me on TikTok and Twitter at Laney Film. You can find all of us at Lights on the Screen on Instagram. Tail. You can find me pretty much everywhere, Twitter, Letterbox, Tumblr, YouTube, the whole deal, at Finally Tailored. And you guys can find me pretty much everywhere as well, at Jake Blunden. Next week, as I said, we're going to have our bonus episode for you, which will be our live, very raw <laughs> take and instant reaction on- It might be a bit crazy. Might be on the Academy Award nominations, and then uh, on the Saturday we'll obviously release our more uh, in-depth and thoughts on uh, the actual. Well, nominations. we've had time to think about it, yeah, and, let it sink and it a not bit. and not be midnight. <laughs> on a Tuesday. (laughs) So that will be our episode next week. So you're going to get two from us next week. Until then, guys, that has been the Lights on Screen podcast, and we will see you next week.